These are two of the most important images in all of modern technology, gradient descent from machine learning and the block sphere from quantum computing. They're both examples of things called belief spaces. That means that points in these spaces correspond to beliefs that you could have about some outcome that you're going to observe. There are lots of different belief spaces out there, and we implicitly have them in mind if we ever say that two beliefs are close or far away from each other. To be more rigorous about that, if we hold belief A and we see evidence supporting belief B, the further apart they are, the more surprised we will be where I'm using the word surprise in the modern mathematical sense, which is based on something called KL divergence. Belief spaces and KL divergence are vitally important in machine learning because to learn is to explore a particular belief space. Somewhere in any belief space, there will be a point that corresponds to the most accurate or helpful belief that you could have about reality. You always want to get to that point as efficiently as possible, and that's true whether you're talking about an animal that's learning to hunt or an AI researcher that's trying to make a self-driving car more accurate or trying to reduce their electricity bill for training that AI. As regards efficiency, there is a dirty secret that belief spaces have, one that you almost certainly haven't been told. Belief spaces such as this one are usually taught as though you can think about them using standard, flat, ordinary Euclidean geometry where the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. But in actual fact, including when you're using gradient descent on them, belief spaces have a highly contorted non-Euclidean geometry, and that's what we'll learn about today. The surface of the Earth is an example of non-Euclidean geometry, which means, among other things, that any flat representation of it is always going to be a misrepresentation. A famous example with this map is that if we look down here, I'm first going to move Greenland around, and we can see that even though I'm not changing its size at all, up on here, its size is dependent hugely on where it is in the map. That's just the nature of the distortion that this map creates. For that reason, organizations like the UN will often use different maps, such as this one, which some poor people mistake for the Earth itself, but anyway, it is at least better at representing area. However, this map still has a lot of problems. Let me show you what I mean. Suppose you wanted to fly from one country to another, and you want to get there as quickly and as fuel efficiently as possible, maybe with a refueling halfway. The thing to do in that situation is to draw a path on the globe, which will get you something like this. And we see that in both of these maps, the trajectory is actually curved. And it's not just bad because it's curved. The plane actually appears to speed up slightly along its path, which is going to be very bad for you if you want to plan that refueling. Belief spaces are subject to the same sorts of distortion that maps are, except it's a bit worse because you have no globe to speak of. For that reason, lots of AI developers don't bother with belief space geometry. TensorFlow and PyTorch, for example, don't use it. They're doing the equivalent, in some sense, of drawing a straight line on one of these maps and expecting it to be a shortest path on the globe. But that's unfortunate, because these AIs could be being trained faster and more accurately. And for that reason, there are a bunch of researchers who are working on modern tools for working with belief space geometry. So suppose that you didn't have access to the nice globe, but you still wanted to understand what was going on with funny trajectories like this. One thing that would be useful to you would be circles. If we draw circles that are equidistant from both our points, then we notice that the trajectory of least distance happens to pierce all of the circles at right angles, and that'll be a useful tool going forwards. Let's work up to an example of a belief space, though. Here is a device that is putting out food. Here is a rat that is very much wanting to know where the next piece of food will come out. Here is the rat's belief. And here is the rat's belief space. If a bunch of other rats show up, they have their own beliefs about what's going to happen, and these beliefs will converge eventually on a very accurate idea of where the next piece of food will come out. The rats are assuming that the food is falling with a certain mean and a certain standard deviation. So it's a Gaussian distribution, we say. If the belief is like this, then the rat expects the food to come out like that. And if the belief is like this, then the rat will expect to see something like this. And what I'm doing right now is called sampling from the probability distribution that is the rat's belief. As with the world map, this space is weird and distorted, and distances won't necessarily work as you expect. And distance matters a lot, because in belief space, distance means surprise. If the rat believes that this is going to happen, but it sees something like this happen, it'll be surprised. And if it sees this happen, it'll be even more surprised. And surprise means rethinking, and rethinking means burning calories, or using more wattage if you're thinking about an artificial neural network and a GPU. Suppose that the rat's beliefs are initially like this, 
but it actually sees a load of food suddenly come out according to this distribution. What's going to happen to its beliefs in between? First, let me say an answer that very much is not correct. It is not going to be the case, looking at belief space, that the rat's beliefs simply move from one point to the other in a straight line. That is not going to happen. Consider this intermediate point. This intermediate point is very unlike this distribution and this distribution. That is, it would be surprising for a rat that had either this belief or that belief. In order for it to work like that, the rat would have to completely abandon its initial beliefs, and then completely abandon its beliefs again to get to the final place. Consider instead this point here, diagonally up from the grey point. This point may not seem very much like these two, but the results of both of these distributions is quite plausible if you had a belief like this one. So this is the natural midpoint of these two points. It turns out that the shortest path between this point and this one is a circular arc, and that is the path that the rat's beliefs take, because the rat is evolved to update its beliefs in an efficient way. As with the world map, it helps to look at the equidistant circles. These circles are very strange to look at, but fun to play with. I've made it so that you can play with this by clicking on a link that you can find in the description. Circles in this space are interesting, because this circle would represent a set of beliefs which would be equally surprising to a person who held this belief, if any of them turned out to be true. If you've ever heard anybody say, it would amaze me if anything like that was the case, or you've been in a situation of having to weigh up three different opinions that all seemed implausible to you, you've been in a situation where circles like these ones are relevant. Points at the bottom of this space represent complete certainties. That is, the rat believes with certainty that food is going to drop out at this exact point here. These things are called Dirac deltas, and they're used quite a bit in quantum physics. And by the way, the distance between any non-certain distribution and a certainty is infinite. Since we have circles, we also have rotations. If you look at the window down below, if I grab this point and rotate around it, we're able to make all of the points go around it, and they all keep their belief space distance from it. If you look up above, you see a bunch of curves which are all moving around a single curve which is not moving very much at all. That's the orange one here. There is an area of neuroscience called active inference where rotations quite similar to these ones play a very special role. It's very strange to be looking at a circle or a rotation and be saying that its center is in such a strange place. But that's just the nature of the distortion again. It's a bit like how if I bring out the Mercator projection and I rotate the Earth around a certain point, we see an extremely strange distortion on the Mercator. And that's just the way that maps work. This space has a name. It is called the Poincaré Upper Half Plane. Based on that, you might have thought that Henri Poincaré was a man who was very interested in statistics. But it's not the case. Poincaré had no idea that this thing was connected to science. He was just really enamoured of the idea of a space where the shortest distance between two points could be a circular arc. I want to briefly show you a different belief space. This is a very important one in neuroscience that's called the probability simplex. In order to catch this fly, the frog is doing things called saccadic eye movements. Those are the movements that your eyes do when you're looking for something, like looking for your keys on your desk. Saccadic eye movements are extremely important in medicine. If your doctor has ever done this and told you to follow their finger with your eyes, there's all sorts of things they could have been checking you for, including Alzheimer's and schizophrenia and autism. In the probability simplex, each corner represents the frog having complete certainty that the fly is on a particular lily pad. As it looks from lily pad to lily pad, it sees whether the fly is there or not. If it's there, then it becomes certain and it out goes the tongue. If it's not there, then the frog becomes more certain that the fly should be on one of the other lily pads, so its belief moves away from the point representing that lily pad. If the frog eliminates all but two of the lily pads, then the point representing its beliefs should be on the edge between those two. So we've seen our two examples of belief spaces. They're sometimes also called statistical manifolds, and they're studied in the field that is known as information geometry. If you're interested in reading about how it's used in AI, then you want to look up a thing called natural gradient descent. As I've alluded to, AI developers don't usually use this kind of geometry very much, but they do very frequently use KL divergence, and this belief space surprise distance is the second order approximation of KL divergence, known as the Fisher distance. One reason natural gradient descent isn't used very much is that it's still seemingly quite inefficient to use second order methods of any kind to train an AI, but there's something strange going on there because apparently it's efficient when animals do it. 
Still, since AI developers are using KL Divergence a lot, it's probably worth learning this geometry, because it'll feed your intuition about how KL Divergence work, and it's vitally important that we develop intuitions for these AIs, and not just treat them as mysteriously effective black boxes. Information geometry and natural gradient descent were developed by this guy, Shun Ichiomari. He should probably be a bit better known. It's been argued that he should have gotten the 2024 Nobel Prize, because he had something a bit like Hopfield Networks before John Hopfield did. That may or may not be true, I am certainly not qualified to say, but I can at least tell you this, Amari has done more than anybody else in the world to advance our understanding of the geometry of artificial intelligence, and that understanding is still very much in its infancy by the way. This video and my research around it were commissioned by Softmax. Softmax are an AI company doing very deep research around alignment. I am extremely grateful to them, and if you've learned anything from this video then you should be too. For those expecting geometric algebra videos from me, I'll say that there is some of that being used under the hood in this visualisation, and maybe you'll see a paper from me about that eventually. Bye for now.